Welcome back to the Saving Science video series where we attempt to answer the question, does academic science need to be saved? And we're doing so by telling stories, telling our stories. And, and really, this is a collective effort. Um, so when I say we, I mean it's it's the people involved, and it's, and it's a it's a growing majority. I mean, it, there's a there's a silent majority, but they're still there. And so, just a brief recap: we the story starts with many strange observations of ways of doing science that seemed suspect. We grew increasingly concerned and people weren't really supporting us. We were very disappointed in the, our professors and even the university. And then destruction and um, disaster strikes with Daryl Bem's bomb. And it was really, it was really a disaster. I mean, overnight, he flipped the world upside down. More broadly, I mean, specifically the, the field of psychology, but everyone seems to be kind of looking in, kind of nervously waiting for kind of the total assessment of the damage. And kind of like a car accident, a really bad car accident where you're driving by and you, you don't really want to look, but you can't not look, you know, you just. And, uh, but things quickly got better and all these initiatives were happening, transparency, replication initiatives, and it was the most exciting time of, of most of our careers as grad students, early researchers. And so I was really pumped. And but I guess it was kind of short lived as we started facing pushback. And the pushback just got stranger and fiercer <laughs> over time. And that's where we continue today. Um, is more pushback that was more nuanced. So specifically pushback against transparency and replication again. But, but over time, the pushback became stranger and kind of more desperate, I guess, but also more fierce and more more dark, darker. So, and um, so the first story, um, yeah, and I'm gonna try to keep this shorter than last time. I'm starting to get tired of listening to my own voice. Um, but again, we have to get these ideas down and, and do it for the taxpayer and all the other people who rely on science as a public institution. Um, science is paid for by the taxpayer, but it's for everyone like a public park and we have to maintain it and make sure it operates correctly. Or else then we have to rely on what? On pseudoscience, on junk ideas, dangerous ideas, voodoo stuff that kills people. Um, so it's not just that a broken science can, can avoid killing people from treatments that could have been improved, but it's also that when people stray away from science, 
especially in the health and nutrition area, they can cause a lot of harm. And there's there are a lot of groups working on that. And they're also building web tools and, and browser plugin to try to flag uh, spam or uh, fraudulent doctors and quacks, you know, people f selling false hope. I mean, that gets pretty dark, uh, trying to treat cancer with naturopathic medicine or something. Kind of like Steve Jobs, but that's very sad. That's, uh... So, and so the first pushback, well, more nuanced pushback is... Uh, questionable questioning of the reproducibility project, um, which uh, we can pull up the paper. Uh, do, 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 do. do it from here, I think. Looks nicer. Um, There it is, all oh, wrong one. So estimating the reproducibility of psychological science in this was an unprecedented effort, the largest scale effort to estimate the replicability of psychology as a field and deemed, again, to our knowledge, the largest effort to, in the history of science, potentially, to replicate. Well, at first, we just wanted to do as many as possible. Um, but actually, it's better to go like this. But it ended up being 100. And I was, I think, 17. And and we managed to publish it in Science, the most prestigious, considered the most prestigious journal in the world. So there, and there was an ironic twist there. But um, so basically, we attempted to replicate a hundred previous findings, and. The results were not great, though in some ways, yeah, I guess this, so this is showing you the effect size. Again, we don't want to get bogged down in, into the weeds. Um, but again, effect size is over here. In science, when you're estimating a signal, right, you have to estimate the size. How large is the signal that you observe? And so this, this kind of violin plot shows you the original. And so you can see, you know, it's an average of 0.37. And in the replications, it's uh, much smaller, like less than half of that, with a, l a large proportion of the effects below zero, or even the, in the opposite direction. And, and we tried to be humble, and, and, we, and this project was done with unprecedented levels of transparency because we knew there was going to be a major impact and it was going to be highly scrutinized. So in the process of doing the largest large-scale replication effort of all time, we also end up raising the bar in terms of transparency and rigor. Uh, we, got, we had the original authors involved as much as possible. And then we... Um, this is another... Actually, I should be using. <laughs> what am I doing? I should be using the um, 
Oh my lord. The uh, curate science delicious fancy box plugin. <laughs> oh, there's also an animated GIF. So where you can look at stuff. I should full screen it. So this is just another way of looking at it where the original effect sizes are on, on the x-axis, the replication effect sizes are on the y-axis. And so in kind of a perfect world, the, each dot are different studies and there's a hundred of them. So if you had perfect replicability, the dots should be more all towards the diagonal. And so you see, and no, they don't plot, because the studies were coming from social psychology or cognitive psychology, though it's, it, it's a bit fuzzy to classify sometimes. And in general, cognitive psychology was replicating about 50% and social only about 25. But even 50 is, is pretty terrible, because that means, you know, do you, a, a, a coin flip is just as, accurate at predicting whether a random finding would replicate. But of course, this study wasn't a representative sample because we could only do studies that were feasible. And we also want to focus on high impact papers because again, if, we, if a paper has never been read or cited, then it's probably not worth doing replication of. Because replication takes a lot of time and money. It's very expensive. Anyway, so, so we raised the bar in terms of standards, rigor. We had the original authors. And then at the end, we also paid independent auditors, statist statisticians, to double check every result and reproduce it from the data. Um, and then, of course, all the materials, all the data are available and the code and so we tried to be as even-handed as possible and even in the abstract it was carefully constructed to kind of be ambiguous where depending on different ways to define replication the replication the overall replicability rate could be anywhere between 30 and 50 but either way, it, um, the, the goal was not to, to get just one specific number. It was more to show that, first of all, you can do replications. It's feasible to do replications at large scale. And it's showing us, at the very least, that we can improve our standards because again, in science, if you can't even replicate something, then how can you constructively build a, a building of knowledge? So like, again, with with the bricks uh, analogy, right? You, you can't really build um, a sturdy building that's, that's not going to fall when it when the wind blows. What's going on with the internet? Anyways. So, so you need stronger foundational bricks. And you don't have to replicate all the time. But uh, you do need to, to replicate once in a while. I can't find it. And... So, it definitely caused a stir, covered again in, in, in like over 200 newspapers in a couple days. And, uh, but what was, 
and then eventually there, there was criticism and criticism of course is always invited in science it's welcome and uh But when you look at the criticism of these senior researchers who clearly are researchers who've benefited the most from the flawed system, right? So that's, but you have to be careful. That's not an ad hominem attack because we're going to, because the substance is both their position and the substance of their criticism, which was mostly misplaced. Uh, and so for the first one by Gilbert et al., and this is the same Gilbert as the one who's literally going online with his loud, he has one of the loudest megaphones ever, going in the public square and sh trying to shout us down by calling us replication bullies for doing the very basics of science. And he wasn't joking. He did subsequently offer a quasi-apology. And you can read it. It's... It's... Um, seems half genuine. But hey, uh, that's not relevant um or not that relevant <laughs> so their criticism is mostly statistical nitpicking and well no it was even sillier it was it was basically oh we did the statistics wrong if you do them correctly the replicability rate is actually undis indistinguishable from 100% uh i don't even want to pull it up i don't want to get too into the weeds but but again this doesn't even i mean i mean you should make it you should make uh anyways i don't want to mock but like they could have tried to make their criticism a bit more believable i mean it was and again in our defense or in their defense it's true that we we oversold we were trying to be humble but we did kind of oversell it as maybe a little bit over definitive because 100 studies is a lot but in terms of sampling error you know there's still it's still a small sample excuse me if you start looking at the error the margin of error of people use 36 percent of the studies replicated but it's Plus or minus what? Plus or minus three or plus or minus 15, right? I mean, that's a big difference. So it was definitely not a perfect study or mega study. But to write a commentary and, and argue that the actual replicability is indistinguishable from 100%, and again, doing this in the context, so this is the, the twisted part, is, of course, we're only looking at 100 studies, but you have to look at the 100 studies in the context of the flawed ecosystem and flawed incentive structure in which researchers operate. So you, you already should expect a low replicability rate, given there's no incentives to, to do replications and to check your own work before rushing to the press. Right? So it's just kind of a, a non-starter and and it's ironic because these are social psychologists ignoring the social context when interpreting observations but again they, their position is such that um they are just interpreting things in a sort self-serving way right um kind of like that uptown quote 
it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. This one. Up, Upton Sinclair. I said this so many times, I was getting sick of it. So it could be better articulated. <laughs> so basically, it's Gilbert's job to misunderstand the reality of how devastating the situation is. So, because again, the, con the, the broader context is that there was dozens and dozens of other teams also failing to replicate findings, right? I mean, we mentioned the elderly priming, uh, the Simone Schnall, and there was a bunch of other social priming replications that were also not working out. So again, it's the combination, okay, knowing the flawed incentive structure, then knowing these, all these little grumblings of, oh, uh, you know, these social priming effects are not working out. And then it's in the context of just the everyday known fact that you talk to research assistants and the people doing the studies, most studies don't work out. And most times you can't even replicate your own effects. And then there's even a survey where they asked scientists, how many times have you attempted to replicate some other person's findings and failed to replicate? And it was the vast majority, right? And so for you to argue there's no replica, replication problem uh, is highly questionable. And then it begs the question, well, are you, you yourself not doing replications in your own lab? And there's several other people. But I don't want to name names. But you know who you are. And if you're making that argument, it tells me that you're not even doing proper replications in your own lab. Because if you did, you would see how hard it is to replicate findings even from your own lab. Again, this is social psychology specifically. I can't speak, this doesn't speak to other areas because we know that other areas of psychology um, have higher replicability rates. Like in cognitive, like I said, <laughs> the more boring areas, well, boring as being facetious um but the so that's just strange i mean that's oh and then the, the next one um basically and, and this was published in pnas by an editor susan fisk which we'll come back to. And again, there's there's a lot of tribalism here. There's a clear out-group, in-group dynamic where the status quo defenders who still are mostly in power are battling against the proletariat, right? The, the small person, the everyday person. And we don't have the power but we have the truth on our side. We have evidence. We have replication evidence. High quality. Actually, if anything, basically the highest quality evidence that psychology has ever seen in the history of psychology. We were producing replication evidence that met the highest standards in terms of rigor, transparency, pre-registration. We really raised the bar. And... and and all they could come up with is these feeble, laughable criticism. And again, I, I'm saying this with all due respect, but I'm trying to communicate uh, without taking 10 hours. And so this next, yeah, so it's the, it's the arrogance. Because um, often it wasn't just the content of their criticisms. And the substance that was misplaced, it also the the tone. Though the tone, I mean, I don't care if you want to be, and if you want to be a 
demeaning, condescending writer. I mean, that's fine. I mean, but you're going to detract from your message, right? Um, but we'll come back to the issue of tone, which has the flip side of when you can't criticize the substance of ideas, then your last resort is to to criticize uh, the the tone or the style or attack the person, which we saw previously. So in this next criticism, and I'm not going to name name again, because these are general problems, but uh, people will know. Uh, the commentary was about reanalyzing. Oh, no, they did another kind of meta study where they asked people to judge the context sensitivity, meaning how sensitive would each study be to different contexts. And then showed some simple, simple correlation or something. Well, they controlled for a bunch of stuff and allegedly found that the uh, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> but they tried to show that um, the studies perceived to be more context, context sensitive were less likely to replicate. Um, but it was flawed and it was a good kind of takedown by, I think, Yarconi. I'll link to it. But, but again, it, it, even on the surface, you don't even have to get down into the weeds here. Like, is this really your counter argument that the replicability rates are low? And again, we're not talking about that, like, well, low as in the 35% number. Plus or minus 15. Uh, but again, context sensitivity, well, but, but how come in, in the current literature, when you open journals, right, back then, in the early 2000s, it was always the same group of people publishing in the top journals, and their papers were showing very nice patterns consistent across studies and and even in social priming there was different groups of different labs around the world producing these effects consistently across studies across papers across different contexts different cultures different languages so and so how can you you know what i mean like it, how come your own um, findings were so context insensitive? They're not context sensitive at all. Yet you try to uh, criticize the reproducibility project for somehow having chosen studies that are context sensitive. So yeah, uh, again, it's 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 you have to interpret things in the broader perspective. You have to take the broader context, not just interpret the one paper in a vacuum. So this is kind of what they're doing. They're 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 just focusing on the paper as if it existed in a vacuum. And this gets abstract, I guess, because in meta science, I mean, you are studying the scientists, and therefore you have to interpret the data in the context of the environment the scientists are operating, which includes their personal lives and their personal characteristics, uh, you know, how humble they are, how much doubt they have, how, how bias they are all these things we talked about so that's just um oh and now we have further evidence and i can actually yeah this is a good time to show some more graphs some more beautiful well no these are not yet beautiful because it relates to the context sensitivity so if we go to many labs no this one and we look so 
Yeah, and I wish I had a better diagram for this. I, I, I think I was working on one for the book. So, so it's true. In another way, the reproducibility project was flawed. So again, I mean, I can point out the flaws. <laughs> so that's the other part of these uh, commentaries is there, there were flaws that they could have criticized us on that would have been more valid and more compelling, but they, they, they seemed so, I mean, you could tell there was kind of an emotional. And so maybe they just went with their kind of knee-jerk response. But, um, but through other channels, there were some valid criticism that it's, it's true. We, took, we looked at 100 studies, but only did one replication of each of the 100 studies. Right. And in my subsequent replication work, I did, I would routinely do two replications. And so I would replicate my replication and, and usually tweak a few little things and then see if at least there's consistency across my samples within the same place. And so the next kind of big project, which was called Many Labs One, well, Retrospectively, it was called a many labs replication. Um, where, where now we were going to investigate um, Here's the graphic. So I think it was around 13 effects. So we're going to look at 13 different effects, but repeat them, I'm thinking 26 here, uh, here it's in the, across 26 different labs, 36, wow, see, so it, it so 13 effects across 13, 36 different labs for basically about almost 500 replications. Right? And in this case, but they did mostly replicate. I think it said 10 out of 13, depending how you define it again. I'd say a more even-handed interpretation would be closer to 50. Because again, if something replicates at a quarter of the size of the original, then that that's probably a different animal, but again, um, so here what you're seeing is, you know, this is one effect, the anchoring effect, and the original is in blue, the blue uh, cross, and then each dot is a different replication from a different lab, which could be anywhere around the world, whether U.S., gray, or international and green. Um, and so, uh, so you can see that these actually replicate at, at a larger size, and then these replicated pretty similar, right? So the the dark green is kind of the the mean across replications, and then down here, these ones aren't replicating, but. And there's lots of things to say, but overall, this was almost kind of like a damage control where we wanted to do a, be a better design. Well, no, I wasn't part of this one. <coughs> Excuse me. But also, they picked a, they kind of purposely picked effects that were more classic, older. See, there's even some from the 40s, 50s. Uh, versus more recent, and then some that were more cognitive, more simple, and then kind of more where you'd be more confident, and then some that you'd be more doubtful, kind of like the social priming stuff. And yeah, overall, the, it, it was a lot more encouraging. And it was good to be able to say like, no, no, replicability is possible. Because that's another response that would, people would have is like, wow, come on. Well, we, we even wrote a commentary against some of this stuff. Uh, people were saying, no, no, psychology is too complicated. And it's too complex and it's too dynamic. So replicability is, is 
is too much of a high bar. But that, but that's unacceptable. I mean, the moment you lower your standards that low, then then again, you have to believe everything, including ASP and Gwyneth Paltrow stuff and naturopathic medicine. So no, we cannot. This is where would where are these people getting these ideas? But again, it's self-serving. If you're an established professor that, who made a career on findings that most likely won't replicate, whether for whatever reason, um, then I guess there's a lot on the line. But but no, not even. Because if you have nothing to hide, then you shouldn't be afraid of replication. So I think that, that's where it got darker, right? Because if if you truly did the research at a high quality, and then the phenomena does change over time, and that's also why social psychology and social sciences is more complicated than physics, potentially, because there are phenomena that are changing, and, and things that change in the world, like technology, like the internet, that, that probably have truly changed social psychological phenomena. Right? And, but you can't take all these true facts about the challenge level of psychology as a perpetual excuse to explain away negative results. You have to be able to, to accept changing your beliefs based on the evidence, which is falsifiability, which is kind of one of the key essential distinguishing features of science, but we're not going to get too abstract. But coming back to context, sensitivity is that if you look at, and I don't know if I have it here. Um, oh yeah, right there. This actually shows you, again, without getting into too technical statistics, but heterogeneity is whether so again these effect sizes is basically that okay the effect was not exactly the same in a different labs around the world right uh, but based on just random sampling error you're going to expect deviations from the true value and so but if the signal, if the effect size is very more than you expect based on just normal sampling error, then you would have a position to say that uh, the effects might actually be different in different places in the world, which is the context sensitivity hypothesis. But overall, if you look, uh, there's... There's, well, there's, actually in this one, I was thinking of another one. So this one, there, there are effects, uh, and, and the larger effects have more heterogeneity. But in terms of the smaller effects, or the ones that don't replicate, then there's no uh, heterogeneity. So let's look at many labs, too. Oh, that one I don't have the heterogeneity. Many labs three. I think this one was. Yeah. So this also speaks, or at least is inconsistent <clears throat> with the context sensitivity argument because it's just showing, well, there are differences across labs, but it's mostly explained by just random sampling error. And so the many labs it was an improvement in many ways. And then there was different improvements made. Um, so for many labs too, It was an even broader 
set of effects and this one's an even nicer graph so you can see the distribution of effect sizes across labs and the original effect size is the uh, triangle and so you can see that there are and this is correspondence bias is a classic social psychology I mean that's from 2002 but uh, I thought there was another one Uh, again, very reassuring that it's it's not it's not you know some stuff is replicating, and so it is a forest fire, but it's you know it's not all rotten. So this is moral judgment stuff that seems to replicate other judgment, decision making biases, framing biases. But then as the effects get kind of more flashy or more implausible sounding, they become less replicable. Well, these are still replicable, right? Though I think this is kind of the edge where, well, again, it's a fuzzy boundary. So but to me you'd, you'd want that well you want the 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 average effect to have its margin of error greater than 0 um that's one way of doing it but around here things get hairy consumerism and Consumerism undermines trust. You see, like, that sounds pretty out there. Though again, in science, strange ideas doesn't—it doesn't mean it's—it's—it's it's, it's, uh, never possibly true. It's just the, the probability will be lower, and that's why Einstein's ideas were so potent because they, they sounded crazy, but they, they turned out to be corroborated in experimental tests, right? But so far, the stuff that's replicating in general is definitely sounds more plausible and less flashy. Anyway, I think that's enough. Uh, priming heat, vertical position and power, that's some more embodiment stuff. Moral violations and cleansing, that's more embodiment slash social priming. Or just strange things. Okay, so moving on. Um, so then, so there was just more of this pushback. And again, it gets stranger because it just starts seeming a bit desperate. And then... Yeah, and then people were using social media more and Facebook more. This is also strange, but these psychologists created these Facebook groups to discuss methods and how to do science, you know, more rigorously. And um, and these groups got big. I mean, it was ten thousand people at the time. Now I think there there are over twenty thousand researchers. Well, psychologists, but again, people are watching and, you know, they like to see, I guess, academics debate things. And people spend a lot of time. Um, but then things got squirrely in terms of, again, people becoming emotional and childish and and. But people are just trying to get to the bottom of this. Like, how come, in terms of these questionable questioning of and this questionable pushback against transparency replication? I mean, these are psychologists. We're curious. We're trying to understand other people's behaviors, including our colleagues' behaviors. 
And and then the methods Facebook groups, the moderators started clamping down and saying, oh, no, you've been giving a warning. You cannot be in this group and started banning people, starting, started censoring speech. And I'm looking at this and thinking, what in the world? Like, it felt like, you know, high school or, or junior high childishness. Um, and I've documented this. I have like pages and pages and screenshots. Like I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, and it's true. A lot of academics are assholes and, and autistic or otherwise socially unhinged, but, um, that's just part of living in a world. Um, and everyone's trying their best, but people have a lot of flaws and have a lot of ego. So you're going to expect some conflict. But these people are literally banning people because they were rude or had an inappropriate tone. And yeah, I don't want to get too much in the weeds. I keep saying that too much. <laughs> Um, no, I'm not going there. Okay. So, so yeah, there's censorship, but this is where I, I, it kind of went, started going back towards the ideal, ideological problems because it seemed like an overreaction and it did start making sense in terms of, oh, no, no, this is the, the, the radical social justice issue where people are seen as well first of all they see everything in terms of power structures or and so if you're part of a marginalized group you you don't have power and and you got to check your privilege and all this stuff and because the language was really like oh you you have to really um like we we're not gonna accept anything that's remotely personally attacking or harmful verbally harmful and these vague kind of code of conduct um anyway so it it's just got weirder and um and but it was related to the issues of replication. Um, and so in one case, I mean, this one we will mention because it was so public. Uh, Amy Cuddy was a Harvard professor who, again, wrote a um, best-selling book called Presence and viral TED Talks. Actually, it was the, the most seen TED Talk of all time with like, you know, 30 million views. And people were saying, you know, when are people going to stop criticizing Amy Cuddy? And, and they're, they're piling on and, and they're kind of accusing people who criticize her of, of being sexist. <clears throat> but but her behavior was questionable. I mean, it had nothing to do with her sex. It, 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 it's the fact that, so her findings failed to replicate in several, um, those ones are on curate science, in several papers. And, and again, they're better, they're, they're, they're much better design, larger sample size, higher power, more transparent. And again, instead of finding relevant flaws and actually um, looking at substantive issues with the replications, or instead of just doing her own replications and proving the world that she has nothing to hide, uh, instead she basically moves the goalposts. So moving the goalposts, as you can see, it, it, it's, it's a bit uh, 
sneaky. Right, where someone's taking a shot and after they've shot, you move the goalpost. And <clears throat> so instead of doing things she could have done, she just shifts the, the focus on broadening the DV. So, I mean, in her paper, it was something like power posing. So if you're you know, in this, these again, this is embodiment. If 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 you're power posing, in the, you put your body in the position of positions of of power. That's gonna give you more power. I mean, she has a pose again. I don't want to bring up her face, but um, and her message was that she's helping the weak because she was she was. I mean, her power posing. She was claiming could could help anyone, but it did fit with the ideology of we want to help the marginalized people, and and because power posing, sorry, the DV was that it makes you uh, more confident through like a hormonal increase in testosterone. I mean, it got even. Um, into the the biophysiology. Uh, let's pull it up. So, oh no. So it's um. And made you more risk, risk taking. But then, in her new uh, study, they kind of shift the DVs to instead of measuring risk taking, they they started measuring broader things like health and confidence. And then when it, but, and the other questionable thing she did was she was being interviewed and said, oh no, we did some new systematic review, which is kind of when you, you, you combine studies in a meta-analysis or, or in a review to kind of make a, a more general point, right? So, and instead of defending her specific finding, she just said, well, look, there's already, there's, all this other evidence showing that power posing can benefit you in other ways that are more subjective. But then when people on Twitter ask her for, well, like, where's the evidence for this claim? Can we see the paper? What, why are you talking to journalists uh, about this evidence that hasn't even been in the public domain and she refused right so i'm sorry if you're if you're telling journalists that you have new evidence that kind of uh deflects or not deflects but it because it, she was doing it to to quell doubt or reduce doubt of her power posing effect um and then she refused to share it with the scientific community, right? which to me is uh, is just not acceptable, right? Because again, if you're not like if you're not willing to expose your ideas to scrutiny, then you can't claim to have some new discovery to go to the journalists and say, "Oh, power posing is fine," because I have a new meta analysis which I haven't shared with anyone. And I'm not even willing to share it. It's like, okay, well, if you're not willing to share it, then you can't go out and disseminate it. I mean, so anyways, people on Facebook and yeah, there's, there's mean people. It's the internet. And I think someone, <laughs> and, you know, it's even hard for me to repeat this, but because um, in her TED talk, she begins a TED talk by saying that she was in a bad car accident and she lost 
she makes a bold claim, like something like 10 IQ points. But she still managed to finish undergrad, though it took her longer. And then she went to grad school, and now she's a Harvard professor. I mean, it's very, it's it's a well, I mean, it's it's an emotional, it's an emotionally gripping, persuasive talk. But then these people were kind of, I forget exactly. Oh, I think they said maybe she's doing bad research because she still has a concussion from the car accident or something. And that's pretty distasteful. But um, again, uh, are you going to censor that speech? Well, those people were censored. And uh, so then these other people formed a different group. Uh, which was not censored and and most people left the psych map so it's called psych map and then the other one was called psych methods and over time we could check but the uh, the non-censored group grew twice the size because people just wanted to well i guess some people are interested in uncensored and kind of even if it means once in a while dealing with annoying people or distasteful people, it's still better to have an unconstrained discussion where once in a while you have to deal with with unflattering comments, but it's still uncensored. Anyways. So moving on to try to wrap up. Uh oh yeah, and I guess that's feeds into the more ideological weirdnesses. Where, so this was a conference panel at a conference and, and, and this is relevant. So they, the social media was on the rise. So this is another external factor that's beyond everyone's control that played a pivotal role in well not a pivotal role but it affected how like the the replication culture is changing in psychology but social media is also increasing social media use which gives more power to the weak right which is why the internet is such an important democratic and and uh liberating tool which i guess some companies are, are trying to influence with all this net neutrality stuff but we're not going to go there um it gives almost anyone a platform i mean this video series itself is an example of that anyone can get a blog or a youtube channel and they have a platform right so at this conference panel they were discussing the responsible use of social media to discuss and cr critique research. Very timely. Um, actually, I'll try to link to it. It's, you know, and so there was two men and two women on this four-person panel, and there were two moderators, one man, one woman, uh, interesting, who were fielding questions from the audience and from Twitter or something. And at the end of it, it was about an hour, uh, someone sends a tweet saying, how come we're not talking about the gender bias in speaking time that's happening right now? Where men, the claim is specific, and the moderator just kind of read it instead of filtering or moderating maybe. Because the claim was specifically that, that men were over-talking over the woman and you can watch the video immediately the two men were shocked they were like what and shocked and guilty looking and, and apologetic and and they turned it to them and uh nosek i believe it was nosek and richard lucas they they kind of apologized and well i i 
no, they didn't apologize, but they seem apologetic and said, well, I didn't notice that, but, you know, maybe it's true. And then Susan Fisk, who was one of the female panelists, she just sat there and shook her head, uh, saying, well, we're used to it. Right? So she, she accepted it without much scrutiny. She jumped to the conclusion that, yeah, this observation must be correct. But anyways, <laughs> and, I'm, and I was watching. I think you could see the live stream or something. And I couldn't believe my ears and my eyes. Um, and they kind of moved on. But, but online, and again, this is the beauty of the internet, there were grumblings, other people saying, oh, what, is this really true? And uh, maybe we could count. <laughs> and so uh, again, on the Facebook group, and this like went over, this went on for like a week. People go on Facebook debating and dissecting and counting and reviewing the video and counting the exact number of minutes the men and women were talking. And they found basically nothing. It was about equal. And I just made a comment saying, wow, like, who has this kind of time? And it's kind of disgusting that we're spending this much time determining if men and women talk the exact number of minutes on a conference panel while there's the, the wildest, largest raging forest fire replication crisis in social psychology <clears throat> and then this female professor who will remain nameless um wrote a blog post and she put my face right on the blog post basically attacking me saying this is why i beep a swearing <laughs> uh care about equality right because all of all immediately i was attacked in the comment section for not caring about gender equality which i didn't say uh and and in which i don't believe i mean i care i care, i i care about uh women's rights individual rights anyone's rights civil rights um though i wouldn't go as far as equity so equality of opportunity of course <laughs> this is um it's it's obvious but in terms of equity in terms of equal outcomes and achievements you know that's a different ball game which i don't want to get into but um maybe later and it was vicious i mean it was very strange um and it was and it really hurt and again i'm not i don't, I don't want to paint myself as a victim too much because, you know, it's just like, I wouldn't even call it cyberbullying, but that's what they, some people call it. You know, it hurts because there was thousands of people that saw that. And I was getting private messages from people supporting me, but only in private. And this is important. It, it's kind of um, pluralistic ignorance is a social psych phenomenon where privately people believe something but publicly they act differently, right? They, they act as if they don't care about this kind of bullying or censorship, but they don't admit it publicly, but privately they think it's wrong. They just don't want to voice the opinion, right? And that's exactly what was happening. Um, and it was only later I realized, oh, but it's because of the power structures again. So I, um, yeah, because in another instance, which was also uh, ridiculous, um, I was criticizing another conference, SIPS, the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science, for not having enough political diversity and, and having kind of a, it was very, um, yeah, I mean, it's a tense kind of politically correct environment. And I got attacked for being a white, what was it, a white dude with white privilege. Um, 
So again, it's like, how do you have time to think about these things when science is already hard enough? Now we're in a replication crisis of epic proportions. We're getting all this strange pushback, which is getting stranger. And now there's this ideological warfare, this culture war going on. It's just like, how is this possible? Anyways, that's where I, I had to take a break uh, and, and worked on my book and then just couldn't believe it. Um, and it goes on and on. I mean, I could talk for four hours about different stories that were equally, if not stranger. Okay, just a few more. Oh, one more. So that's that was mostly the well, pushback against replication, pushback against criticizing people online. Oh, you know, the end of that story was that eventually, well, no, so the, the, um, the general topic that was being debated was how to use social media responsibly without damaging people. Which I guess is true. I mean, I, I've partly experienced it, um, but it's the wild internet, and so it's going to be hard to control. And we already have uh, codes of conduct and research integrity principles we're supposed to be following, and also just common sense and your own reputation. I mean, if you're an asshole online, People are going to learn you're an asshole and, and they're not going to want to invite you on collaborations and invite you to conferences. I mean, we already have a reputational system. I guess in larger online communities, it can be harder to learn about those reputational dynamics. And that's why some people are working on alternative technologies um, to try to mimic the real life face-to-face -face reputational dynamics that happens and works so well in small communities and so duplicate that online somehow, I think would be pretty uh, useful. And so this senior professor, Susan Fisk, again, on the, I guess, other team, she was at a conference in uh, Germany and she literally made the case that where is it? It's immoral to use social media to criticize uh, scientific findings, and called us a methodological terrorist. She literally used that term, methodological terrorist, and she wrote a letter. And this was going to be published by the APS Observer. And it was leaked, and uh, she she toned it down. But I mean, again, we knew it was bad. We knew these people. Okay, these people are a bit upset. Uh, maybe it's affecting their, their book sales. Okay, we underestimated that. But still, to go from that to calling anyone who uses social media to criticize scientific findings a methodological terrorist. Because she was saying, oh, we, like, you know, just like how a terrorist will kill in the name of some pursuit. She was likening us to terrorists just for, like, actually discussing problematic findings and this trying to interpret replication results and trying to assess the damage in this situation. I mean, this is, this is, um, you know, it leaves you speechless a little bit. Um, and then, but luckily there was an outcry and, um, there was a grad student. What was her name? Um, and she <laughs> was courageous enough to, uh, stand up and, and, ask her to clarify and she didn't back down and she and then i think she even spoke to susan after 
and she she seemed apologetic but didn't really back down with the terrorist uh language though in her piece she did remove it anyway so this is a good place to stop oh no there's one more but you see how we went from the replication bully, the replication police, the data detectives, and now methodological terrorists. Um, and we're sacrificing our careers. We're knowingly entering a business. And we're being called these things. Um, but again, in retrospect, it it kind of makes more sense but it's still pretty vicious um and um so oh yeah and the stakeholders to uh this has a way to maybe leave things off if we go back to our system, so it was now as if the the system was was uh, breaking apart into two factions, kind of actually more than two factions. So, kind of there was the elite group, which is kind of desperately holding the power, but actually they still are clinging mostly to their power. I mean, some of them have taken early retirement. But on the whole, it's still pretty intact. And then it was just complete chaos because it's already crazy enough in academia to apply for jobs and it's hyper competitive. Now you kind of have to figure out, oh, is that department on board with open science? Or are they not on board? How do I package my publication list? How do I sell myself because some of these departments it actually might hurt your chances to say you care about open science so you have to kind of figure out how to navigate this this situation that's still in crisis kind of like a civil war where there's still basically a battle going on anytime well it's like actually it's more like a ceasefire i guess uh things have settled down Right, there's really there's not that many explosions and and gunfires anymore, but it's still unclear what's going to happen with the uh, the elite and the power structure. Um, who oh, over here? They still control most of the journals. And the professional societies and the prestigious positions and universities and often even still reviewing grants, right? And so, but if you are listening, um, because there's different factions, there's the common researcher who's mostly on board, who's unambiguously on board with transparency, because uh, they have only to gain. And it's just the right thing to begin with anyway. But there's this large minority. There's other people who don't really care either way. They just want to follow the new standards. Just tell me what the standards are and I'll do it. You know, <laughs> That's again where cured science, we want to make it as easy and as delicious uh, as possible to do science right. And, and just be organized, meet simple minimum standards and then get on with your life get on with doing research and having fun and being curious and just never st stop questioning anything and just flourish um so yeah uh next time we're gonna cover some other strange pushback and then start uh wrapping things up in terms of the flaws in the academic system, though it'll get 
darker with these for-profit publishers. Uh, who, I guess, the bold claim is they might they might be engaging in criminal activities. Um, and, you know, we'll get into that. And then funding agencies have also mostly uh, stagnated and uh, not moving too quickly, except for a few cases in Europe. But even then, it's, it's glacial progress. All right, signing off. Till next time. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.